In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about a few key members of the bacterial family, the Pasteurylaceae. Pasteurella multocida is a very promiscuous pathogen, which causes economically damaging and potentially life-threatening infections in a variety of animal species and also people. When learning about the Pasteurella, don't get confused by the names. There have been a number of taxonomic changes over recent years including the introduction of the genus Manheimia, so Manheimia hemolytica, was formerly known as Pasteurella hemolytica, and more recently Biberstinia triolosi, which used to be known as Pasteurella triolosi. These organisms are generally small gram-negative rods, they're facultative anaerobes, and these bacteria are all biocontainment level 2. Pasteurella species are non-hemolytic, and they characteristically have a very strong very easy to identify indole smell. Microscopically, they have a safety pin morphology, which you can see on the cartoon up here. So there's this bipolar staining. And then our other genera, Manheimia and Biberstinia, are hemolytic. Here you can see a pure culture of Pasteurella multocida. And I want you to note just how mucoid and slimy these organisms are. They produce this very mucilaginous capsule that's really readily visible on uh, an agar plate. In this image, we have a pure culture of Pasteurella multocida, gram-stained. So you can see these short gram-negative rods. They almost have a cocobacillary appearance to them. And when we zoom in a little bit more, I think you can appreciate that safety pin morphology. So this organism here, for instance, has this very easy to see bipolar staining. So it's darker on either end, leaving a slightly lucent area or pinker area in the middle. Looks somewhat like the cartoon. Here we have a pure culture of Manheimia hemolytica. In the gram stained slide on the right, you can see the variably sized uh, gram negative rods. All of these organisms are part of the normal microbiota. They're found in the mouth. Uh, as we'll see, Pasteurylaceae uh, should commonly be associated with the oral cavity, they're in the respiratory tract, and also the intestinal tract. Pasteurella multocida has the ability to survive for up to about a year in the environment, in water, um, while other species tend to survive quite poorly outside the host. Within the family Pasteurylaceae, we have 30 different genera. Pasteurella is one of those, including 13 species. We have 10 species of Manheimia, only one of Biberstinia, so just Biberstinia triolosi, and then Avibacterium uh, has five species. We have a few key virulence factors that are recognized for some of our Pasteurylaceae. So Pasteurella multocida produces a cytotoxin or leukocidin, as well as a capsular polysaccharide. So this capsule which prevents phagocytosis, and like we saw a few slides ago, can really easily be visualized on pure culture, that really mucilaginous, slimy-looking colonies. Manheimia hemolytica uh, has LPS, as do most gram negatives. Uh, this stimulates cytokine release and induces microvascular necrosis. And it also produces a leukotoxin, which is specific to uh, the leukocytes of cattle. Organisms within this family cause three sort of categories of disease. We either see respiratory tract infections, either the upper or lower respiratory tract, sepsis, or trauma-associated infections. So keep these three sort of categories in mind uh, as we go through the clinical presentations associated with each species. Pasteurella multocida is perhaps the most promiscuous. In cattle, we see it as a cause of shipping fever or pneumonia in younger animals, also enzootic hemorrhagic septicemia. In pigs, it causes atrophic rhinitis along with Bordetella bronchoseptica. In rabbits, it causes snuffles, which is a constellation of syndromes uh, from the lower all the way up to the upper respiratory tract. In birds, we see avian cholera. Um, and in cats and other companion animal species, we see abscessation. Manheimia hemolytica in cattle is also associated with shipping fever, and frequently we see this along with Pasteurella multocida. And a similar story. Uh, is true as well for Biberstinia triolosi, involved in respiratory disease and shipping fever. Avibacterium paragallinarum causes infectious coryza in birds, 
And finally, Lone Pinella coalarum uh, is a normal inhabitant of the koala mouth, but in people has been associated with bite wound infections. And so I include this organism to sort of emphasize the fact that our pastoralaceae are frequently encountered in the mouth, and bite wounds should sort of raise the red flag of you might be dealing with one of our pastoralaceae species. We're going to start our discussion talking about shipping fever. Um, this is an acute onset febrile illness. Um, it can be a bronchopneumonia or a fibrinous pleuropneumonia, uh, like you can see here, these very congested, darkened, uh, reddened lungs with this fibrinous material on their cirrhosal surface. Shipping fever is commonly a polymicrobial infection. So a variety of bacteria, like the three listed here, in addition to viruses, are commonly implicated. And together, we oftentimes refer to this as the bovine respiratory disease complex. Shipping fever, or bovine respiratory disease, is precipitated by other insults. So we see bacterial infections when perhaps we have a viral infection, set up the animal to be really susceptible to bacterial infection. We have poor air quality, or we have long distance transport. And that's where the name shipping fever comes from. In younger animals, we can see enzootic pneumonia associated with these bacterial pathogens at the time of weaning, which is a really stressful time for the calves. These infections can have a high morbidity in infected herds, so up to 50% of animals can be sick, and a high case fatality rate. We deal with these infections by isolating affected animals as best we can, and then treating with antimicrobials, typically or frequently macrolide-type drugs, Vaccination can be a really effective prophylactic measure. Um, this would be done on farm, and it has the ability to prevent disease in the feedlot. The challenge with vaccinating for shipping fever is that the person who puts in the financial investment to protect those animals doesn't reap the reward. So the farmer pays for the vaccine and the feedlot benefits. I'm certainly not an expert in the beef industry, but this clearly seems to be a situation where some economic incentives have to be shifted around in order to promote the use of these potentially very beneficial prophylactics. Pastorella multocida is also the cause of a rapidly fatal septicemia in cattle and buffalo called hemorrhagic septicemia. This is characterized by fever, dullness, and discharges from the nose. We see edema in these animals and gravity-dependent gravity sites, so the cervical region and also the brisket. The animals go on to develop respiratory distress, followed by death within as short as 24 hours of the first clinical signs. Uh, this is a seasonal disease, and it tends to occur with the monsoon rains in Asia. Um, it's only caused by particular serotypes of Pastorella multocida. So the B2 serotype and the E2 are associated with hemorrhagic septicemia, and these are different from those which cause shipping fever. So in North America, we do not have these particular strains, and we don't see hemorrhagic septicemia in our animals. In fact, it would be considered a foreign animal disease. Animals are infected with these strains of Pastorella multocida through direct contact with carriers um, or through infected fomites so potentially through sharing a water supply. Like I said, this disease is not encountered in Canada, and actually the only confirmed outbreak of hemorrhagic septicemia in North America was in Yellowstone National Park in the mid-1960s. Treatment of this infection is uh, possible with antimicrobials if you catch it early enough, and vaccinations are also commonly used. Um, whether these are commercially prepared vaccines or bespokely produced autogenous bactrins for the strains which are recognized uh, in a particular herd. In pigs, we see Pastorella multocida as a component of the infectious process responsible for a disease called atrophic rhinitis. Um, this is caused by a combination of toxigenic Pastorella multocida, um, so particular strains, in association with Bordetella bronchoseptica. The pathogenesis of this disease is not completely understood, um, but we know that these toxigenic Pastorella multocida strains don't readily colonize the nares, so they're not sort of always there. We think what happens is that Bordetella bronchoseptica starts the infection, 
It causes some initial damage to the tissues, which allows Pastorella multocida to uh, uh, colonize and proliferate. Toxins produced by the Pastorella multocida then cause epithelial hypoplasia, atrophy of the mucous glands, and also osteolysis, so we get degradation of the bony structures. And ultimately, what we see is uh, atrophy of the nasal turbinates and shrinking and potentially deviation of the animal's snout caused by that bony change. The disease is characterized by excessive lacrimation, so you see tearing um, as we get destruction of those nasal tissues, perhaps deviation of the snout results in blocking of the nasal lacrimal duct. We also see sneezing and epistaxis, which are nosebleeds. Generally speaking, the younger the animal that's infected, the more severe the clinical signs are. In affected animals, the snout gradually atrophies, so we see shrinkage, wrinkling, and possibly lateral deviation. This is a disease or an infection which is transmitted between animals directly, and oftentimes we see outbreaks when new animals are purchased. There's no real magic bullet to treating these infections, um, improving management, vaccination for concurrent infections, um, and antimicrobials all have a role. Although once the disease is done to the nasal tissues and, and those bony structures, it can't be undone. So we can potentially prevent uh, further progression of disease, but we won't reverse the pathological changes that are seen. In these two images here, you can see pigs affected with atrophic rhinitis. So on the left, we have an animal whose snout has sort of shrunken, and you can see how uh, sort of wrinkled the skin is above the nose. It's been pushed up. And then on the right, we have a pig with a laterally deviated snout. So his nose is shifted over to the right. I'd like to start with the image on the right. So in this picture here, the right-hand uh, cross-section of the pig's snout is considered normal. You can see sort of the scrolling of the nasal turbinates um, is unaffected. This is a, a normal tissue and what we expect to find. On the left on the same image, you can see just how degraded these bony tissues are, how this scrolling structure is, is really not present. It's been largely obliterated. In the left-hand image, you can see a bit of a close-up uh, with bilateral atrophy of both the ventral and dorsal turbinates. And this animal also had uh, deviation of the septum. So I think you can see this middle structure here is perhaps a little bit deviated over towards this side. Mm -hmm.